Mr. McCoy back with part 10 of The Ear, the Eye, and the Arm. The lay people moved around him as they went about their dreary work. They paid him not the slightest attention, and perhaps they didn't see him. Tendai had noticed that both Kuda and Rita blended into the background now. Probably he did too, but he couldn't rest long. Sooner or later, the she-elephant were remembered to look for him. He got up and fell. His legs were still shaking. Grimly, he tried again. Once he began walking, his strength came back. He found Rita and Kuda in a vegetable patch sitting next to Granny's chair. What rotten luck, Tendai thought. You should have seen them, said Granny. One had big ears like an elephant. One had bulging eyes like a frog. The third was like a wall spider. Oh, I almost died of fright. Wouldn't you know my grandson would pick a place full of monsters? I wanted to go to the art gallery. Tendai beckoned to Rita and Kuda. Come here. I've got something to tell you two. She's telling us the most exciting story, said Rita. Go on, Granny. What did you do when the froggy grabbed knife? I hit him with my purse. And let me tell you, it wasn't light. I carry nails in it. Yes, I do. I have to in the kinds of dives my grandson likes. Come on, Tendai said, yanking Rita by the hand. Let go, you bully. You stupid girl. Rita clung to Granny's chair, but the old woman pushed her away. You listen to him, she said in a low voice. Don't think I'm senile. That's the mistake everyone makes. They think old Granny's wandering in her wits, but she hears a thing or two. You were going to tell her about the masks, weren't you? Tendai gaped at her, and Granny laughed so hard her rocking chair almost tipped over. The masks, said Rita. Yes, you silly sausage, cackled Granny. Why do you think Knife and Fist brought you here? Not to work in the mines. They have flay people for that. They wanted to sell you to the masks. Now, Granny leaned forward, and her white hair tumbled over her face. Knife has done a stupid thing. As usual, he threw your knife at the froggy, and he left it behind. What do you think your father's going to make of that? The old woman sat back and grinned, showing her naked gums. They're going to sell us to the masks, wailed Rita. Keep your voice down, hissed Tendai. Who are the masks, Kuda said from a seat on the ground. Horrible, horrible gangsters. They cut off people's ears and things. Rita twisted her hair around her finger so hard she almost pulled it out. Shut up, you're frightening her, said Tendai. He should be frightened. They'll chop us into little bits. I want mama, cried Kuda. Now look what you've done. Tendai picked up the little boy, but Kuda flung himself down and screamed at the top of his lungs. I want mama! If the she-elephant hears him, we're lost, said Tendai. Shut up, or I'll really give you something to cry about. Rita shook Kuda. He only howled louder. Footsteps pounded from around the hill. So what's going to happen now? Share your prediction with your fellow listener. Now he's done it, Tendai said, but along a path came not the she-elephant, but Trash Man. His face was screwed up with worry, and he babbled anxiously. I want my mama, screamed Kuda. Trash Man straightened up as though he had been given an order. He scooped up the little boy and ran. Wait, wait, shouted Rita, but the man and boy were off as though a pride of lions were after them. What can I do? cried Tendai. I'd go with them, Granny said calmly. The she-elephant's going to burst a blood vessel when she finds you gone. Won't that be fun to watch, nasty cow that she is? And she won't ask Granny because poor old Granny's wandering in her wits. The old woman rocked back and forth with a malicious grin. Tendai didn't know whether he would really cover up for them, but it hardly mattered. He grabbed Rita by the hand and pulled her along. She woke up from her surprise and took off like a deer. The blade people gazed at them and they passed, but without the she-elephant's orders, they had no interest in fleeing for children. On they ran, but stopped to rest when the pace became unbearable. 
They saw a trash man in the distance. He was striding along purposefully with Kuda perched on his shoulders. Tendai and Rita began walking too, and still no one had alerted the she-elephant. I don't understand, whispered Tendai as they rested in a hollow. I thought Granny hated everyone. Why hasn't she given the alarm? Rita blended in so well he couldn't see her unless she moved. You don't understand, Rita said. More than anything, she hates criminals. She was raised in a convent, you see. She told awfully interesting stories about her childhood. Tendai looked over to where he thought his sister lay. This was a side of the old woman he hadn't known, but he hadn't gone near her if he could help it. Granny's dearest wish is to re-enter a convent and pray for Knife's soul before it's too late. She really loves him. Tendai sniffed a sort of laughter. You know, I can't see you when you don't move. I can't see you either. We're turning into flay people. After a while, we'll start shuffling around and moaning like them too. Tendai had a cold feeling she was right. We'd better go before our luck runs out. Now the edge of the flay was very near. They could see tall buildings and streets. A supermarket bore a sign that said, Venona Grocery in bright red letters. The world they were approaching was like a dream. Tendai heard music, traffic, lawnmowers, even a jackhammer trilled like a distant woodpecker. It was all so beautiful. He was dangerously close to tears. Listen, cried Rita, clutching his arm. Out over the vlay came a distant cry. They couldn't hear the words yet, but Tendai knew what they said. Run, he shouted. They stumbled on. The cry approached them, speeding under the earth, echoing out of the mine shafts. Find, bring, me. Rita fell, and Tendai hauled her to her feet. The streets of Venona were only a few yards away. The she-elephant's commands burst out of the grounds. Bits of the hills began to detach and creep after them. Find, children, bring them to me. They reached the cement walk surrounding the suburb. Tendai dragged Rita over it. They fell to their hands and knees and continued crawling on all fours. Rita was sobbing with terror. Tendai urged her on until they collapsed onto a neat green lawn bordered with daisies. He couldn't move anymore. If the she-elephant herself charged after him, he couldn't react. He watched the vlay with a kind of numb despair. The edge of the wasteland humped up. The vlay people gathered, shifted, turned. They were unwilling to pass beyond their domain. They hovered in a gray tide, watching the children. Then, they simply melted away. Tendai didn't know whether they were waiting or had gone back to their burrows. He could see Rita clearly now. She was a horrid patch of mud on the beautiful lawn. You tramps, get off my property, the woman shouted. The children sat up. The woman stood in the doorway of her house and shook a broom at them. She was neatly dressed with a flowered doek or scarf tied around her hair. She was so tidy both Tendai and Rita laughed for pure joy. Go away before I get the dogs on you. Crazy, the woman muttered to herself as they left the lawn, laughing like little maniacs. Look there, Kuda, Rita said, pointing to a bus platform. Border of Zinnia surrounded an oval parking area. At one end were several benches shaded by a sprawling rose tree. At the other was a drinking fountain. Kuda and Trashman were taking turns squirting each other. Trashman babbled excitedly as Tendai and Rita ran up. He says the bus is coming, translated Kuda, and so it was. A silver gray dot in the sky settled down toward the landing pad. The bus led off two men who frowned at the collection of tramps in their suburb. Then the bus was empty. Hey, Trashman, called the driver. Where did you get those kids? You're not old enough to be their daddy. We were kidnapped by the she-elephant, Tendai said. Please, we want to get away, but we don't have any money. I heard the she-elephant was into nasty stuff. And there she is. So what's happening now? What do you think? Share with your fellow listener. Tendai saw the big woman charge out of the vlay with knife and fist behind. They must have followed on one of the handcars. She was roaring drunk. She staggered down the street brandishing an axe. You filthy brats, she screamed. Tendai, Rita, Kuda, and Trashman jumped into the bus. 
The axe clanged onto the front window and cracked it in two. The driver took off. The she-elephant lunged for the door and fell heavily to the cement. You poor kids, panted the driver as he maneuvered between the buildings. I pressed the panic button. The cops will be here in no time. But Tendai doubted very much that the police would find anyone when they arrived. Well, so you're kidnapped. What are your names? The driver asked. A few weeks before, Tendai would have given him the information without thinking. Now, he no longer trusted the outside world. Fuzzy blue monkeys turned into vicious brutes. Sweet old ladies turned out to be grannies, and the masks would soon be hunting them. Who knew who their allies might be? I'm Jiri Nodvu said, giving a common name. That's my sister Rose and her brother Jabu. You already know, trash man. I see him all the time, said the bus driver, smiling. Listen, why don't I drop you where he always goes? The people there take care of him, so they'll certainly be nice to you. I'll make a special stop outside Rest Haven. Tendai looked at trash man, who was holding Kuda as though he were a large teddy bear. Trash man smiled and said, Mama, it was the first word Tendai had been able to understand. The driver brought his bus to a landing outside a high gray wall. I'm not really allowed to stop here, he explained. See, this is a taxi stand, but it's as close as I can get to rest table. Thank you, said Tendai. I hope the she-elephant doesn't hurt you. Don't worry, my vacation is due to start tomorrow. I'll find someone to cover my route the rest of today. The driver closed the door and they watched him maneuver out of the narrow taxi landing. It was an impressive wall higher than Tendai could see. It curved away without a window or opening except for a single gate directly in front of them. Who lives here? asked Tendai. Mama, replied Trash Man. He yanked on a chain hanging by the gate and a bell rang somewhere inside. It wasn't a mechanical sound like the ring of a holophone, but a real bell with a metal clapper. It rang deeply, sweetly, dying away like far music. Oh, said Rita, do it again. So Trash Man rang it several times until Tendai caught his arm. He might make them angry, he said, and indeed the face that showed up at the peephole did look angry. What do you want? Go away, it said. But then it recognized Trash Man. Chidu, it cried in a pleased voice. Mama, said Trash Man. The gate opened after many locks and bolts had been undone, and an enormous woman stood before them. She was fully as large as the she elephant, but where the queen of the Vlay people had been coarse, this woman was dignified. She was wrapped in a rough bark cloth and wore no shoes, yet she did not look poor. She had a handsome, intelligent face. Oh, Chidu, what have you done? she said. Trash Man held out Kuda and babbled happily. I can see he's cute, but he's not one of us. You can't bring him in. Please, my, Tendai said politely. We were kidnapped and Trash Man rescued us. We're awfully tired. Can't we come in for a while? Chidu is always welcome, of course, but we don't like strangers. They bring contamination. I know we're dirty, but we can wash, said Rita desperately. The gatekeeper looked at her. I wasn't thinking of the kind of dirt that can be washed off. You bring with you evil city ways. Oh, please, cried Rita, bursting into tears. Kuda, catching her misery, began to cry too. Trash Man's face screwed up when he saw Kuda's distress. He sat down on the cement and howled. Stop, stop cried the large woman, covering her ears. Very well, Chidu. They can come in, but only for a while. The trash man's tears dried up at once, and he beamed happily as though nothing had ever been wrong. Grumbling and complaining, the woman led them inside and slammed the gate. She began to fasten the many locks and bolts, but Tendai had no eyes for this. He was far too surprised by the scene inside. They had just left a tangle of apartment buildings in the year 2194, they had stepped into a vanished world from the distant past. A trail led down a hillside past mosses trees to a small village. Down the middle of the valley ran a stream with marshy paddocks on either side. Goats and cattle cropped the grass while small boys guarded them with switches. Someone played a drum in the distance. Nearby, a woman sang a lullaby to a baby. 
Tendai thought he had never seen anything so peaceful. What happened to the city? he whispered. All traces of the world he knew had vanished. Even the wall seemed to disappear, and he saw it was a giant curving mirror on the inside. The effect of this was that the land seemed to go on forever. We do not speak of the city here, said the gatekeeper, and I warn you to not do so either. I am the only one who deals with the outside. Forget your robots and traffic, your crime and your drugs. This is Rest Haven, the heart of Africa. She led them down the path. Trashman bounced along, chattering happily and holding out Kuda as though he were a trophy. Very nice, Chidu, said the woman. Is that his name? I thought he was called Trashman, said Rita. That is what we call him. Are you his mother? The woman laughed. He calls everyone here mother. He has belonged to the whole village ever since we found him abandoned outside the gate. At first, no one wanted him. Why not? asked Rita. He was a Murawima, a child whose mother had thrown him away. His ancestral spirits might have brought us trouble. You mean, you might have left him to die? Rita cried. It's very foolish to neglect the ancestral spirits, said the gatekeeper. Just look at the world you come from. Gang warfare, drugs, crime, broken families. Your people have forgotten about the ancestors and the spirits are angry with you. But as you can see, she led them past a group of children who clapped politely to greet them. We didn't leave Chidu to die. The children stood respectfully to one side as the visitors walked down the trail. Tendai was struck by their good manners, and Mazo, a stranger, would have been greeted with suspicion, if not fear. We decided that no one should adopt him, the woman went on, but that all of us would feed him as if he came to the door. He has a wandering spirit, though, she sighed. He can't stay anywhere more than a few days. I suppose it's because his mother threw him away. I think it's because he had to wander from house to house here, said Rita. They came to a collection of huts set around a neat courtyard. Tendai saw with delight that it was exactly like the villages in his history books. Separating the huts from the trees was a wide stretch of bare land and bare ground, which he knew would be inspected each morning for the footprints of rodents or the looping trails of snakes. The grass roofs of the houses extended out from the wall so as to be supported by a circle of poles. This provided an attractive area of shade. So which would you prefer, the city of 2194 or this area here that is set up like the ancestors lived in? Share your preference with your fellow listener. And now moments more for today of the ear, the eye, and the arm. All the entrances faced west and each door consisted of a wooden panel hung on oxhide loops. These panels were propped open in the heat of the day. The walls of the huts were decorated with black, red, and ochre designs, while the doors were carved with cross-hatched decorations. The finest building was, he knew, the kitchen hut, but the cook fire had been moved outside for the summer. Beside the fire rested a drying rack for wooden bowls, but the thing that struck Tendai most was the smell. The she-elephants cooked fires always had something vaguely unpleasant about them. It might have been the mixture of twisted lay bushes and peat she used for fuel, or it might have been the plastic-filled soil of the lay itself under the fires. More adventures continue in the ear, the eye, and the arm.